evening, Grace. Uh, it's a great blessing to be here once again with you and to open the scripture and to edify one another with, uh, with the word and as we, as we uh, fellowship as well. And so let's go before the Lord in prayer as you open your Bibles also to Romans chapter 3. Today we're going to be in verse 24. We're going to deal with the subject of justification. So if you would, please open your Bibles to Romans 3, 21, and then we'll read to uh, verse 24. But let's go to the Lord again in prayer, asking for his blessing uh, in this time that we set aside to study his, study his word and also to, to sing praises to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you give us to come together and worship you through song, through uh, the word, through fellowship. Thank you, God, that we could uh, be here this evening. Uh, and Lord, we lift up those who are ill, Miss Mary Lou, who is recovering, Pastor David, and uh, Miss Jackson. And Lord, we pray that, that you continue to, to put your hand of healing over them. Uh, bless this time that we have set aside also for the study of your word. May you be with me. May your spirit guide me. And may we be edified through your word. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Romans 3.21. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been uh, manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. Very well. Um, verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, we've already studied the word redemption. Uh, we've also looked at the word uh, grace. And uh, today we're going to look at the word, uh, the concept of being justified, uh, being justified as a gift by his grace. And I'm going to share with you a little bit on, on the, the notes that I've read by Dr. Constable on this theme of being justified. Uh, he says, it is all who believe, verse 22, let's look at verse 22, uh, that, are, that receive justification. It's all who believe, verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no dis distinction. So this justification is available to whom? To all who believe. Not all who have sinned. Verse 23, for all have sinned. So this justification is to the ones who believe, not to all who have sinned. Um, who have, so it says, it is all who believe, not all who have sinned, who receive justification. Justification is an act, not a process. That's important. Justification is something that happens at the moment that we believe. Uh, so the, the moment a person places their faith in the finished work of Christ Jesus, then that person is declared just uh, by God. Justification is an act, not a process. And it is something that God does, not man. Justification is a forensic term or it's a legal term on the one hand it means to acquit uh, on the other on the other positive side it means to declare righteous so let's look at exodus 23 7 exodus 23 7 to acquit that's what justification means uh, to acquit uh, exodus 23 Verse 7, Exodus 23, 7, 
says, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or the righteous for I will not acquit or I will not justify the guilty. So it's a judicial term. It's a legal term. It's to, uh, I will not acqu to acquit. And, G and God says, I will not acquit the guilty. Deuteronomy. So we, we're trying to get the flavor of what justification means. It's a legal term. God will not acquit the guilty. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 20, 25. Verse 1. It says, If there is a dispute between men and they go to court and the judge decides their case and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. So there's the word justify. It, it's, it's a legal term. It's, uh, it's in, in this case, it's in the context of a, a, of a court setting. Okay, so God justifies the righteous. He, he declares them not guilty. But he does more than that. He also declares them righteous. Not guilty. That's the negative concept of justification. But declare righteous is the, the positive side of justification. Let's look at Acts. Acts, Paul's uh, preaching here on his first missionary journey. So we get a flavor of what he preached. Acts chapter 13, verse 37. Acts 13, verse 37. And uh, the word that we're looking for, um, justified, is found in verse, verse 39. So let's start at verse 37. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Uh, how many of you have the word justified instead of the word freed, right? Okay, uh, so it says, and through him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. Um, so justification is a legal term that has to do with uh, acquitting a, a, a person or being made or declaring a person righteous before God. Okay, once again, um, I'm going to read through uh, Dr. Constable's notes. It says, It is all who believe, not all who have sinned, who receive justification. Justification is an act, not a process. And it is something that God does, not men. Justification is a forensic term or a legal term. On the one hand, it means to acquit. On the other positive side, it means to declare righteous. But it does not mean to make one's behavior righteous. It means to make one's position in the sight of God righteous. Okay, that's an important distinction. So uh, justification does not change a person's behavior necessarily. I do believe that justification needs to result in a change of behavior. Right? That's what God expects, that those who have been made light... To, be, to walk in light. Um, those who have, who have been justified, God then wants us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And, and I think that that's what Paul is going to do in chapter 6, 7, and 8. And then again, he picks up the theme in chapter 12, uh, 13, and 14, telling us how we are to live. But who does he address in these chapters? Those who have already been justified. So, but justification, strictly speaking, it, it's a declaration. It doesn't necessarily change the, person, the person's behavior, but it does change the, person, the person's standing before God. We are no longer his enemies. 
We are now his children. We are no longer at war with God, but we, we have peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He continues to say, to say, the word never means to make one righteous or holy, but to account one righteous. Justification is not a change brought by God in us, but a change of our relation to God. Justification describes a person's status in respect to God's law, not to the condition of his or her character. Once again, justification describes a person's status in respect to God's law, not the condition of his or her character. The conditions of one's character and conduct has to do with sanctification. Sanctification uh, is the process where the believer is being um, uh, transformed in his behavior uh, on a daily basis. Uh, as he, that person yields to the Holy Spirit, who is the one who changes him or her uh, by the with, and, and then of course in that process is the instruction that comes through the Word of God. So it's the Holy Spirit working through the individual uh, it, by the Word of God to to change us continually, to change our way of thinking which will result in a, way, in a change in our way of our, in our behavior. He con Dr. Constable continues to say, Justification means that God treats sinful men as if they were a complete and, uns and unstrained virtue. As if they were of complete and unstrained virtue. Do not confuse justification and sanctification. Sanctification is the process whereby God makes the believer more and more like Christ. Sanctification may be changed from day to day. Justification never changes. Okay? So this is important to understand. Our justification is uh, secure because it, it's a declaration that God made uh, on, our, on our behalf at the moment that we place our faith in Christ Jesus. And it's, it's those who have been justified that then God calls to live for, for him, to be holy in their daily uh, life. But we must understand what is our position before God. We are justified. We are justified. And that is what's going to motivate us to live for him, to live for him. So that is justification. It's, it's a declaration of God um, on behalf of, the, of those who put their faith in him. Dr. Moo says, justification, the term refers to God's act, action in accepting Jesus' atonement as sufficient to warrant the acceptance of human beings as righteous even while they are still sinful. That's interesting, huh? God... God looks at us as being righteous in Christ Jesus. And the basis for that righteousness is the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, even though we are still flawed in our daily life. Now, I, I, I know that all of us will never abuse this grace, right? I mean, we, we, we know that who we are in Christ, and, but that's not, that's not so that we could relax and say, well, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm justified, so it doesn't matter how I live. No, it does matter how you live. You know, if, if you are justified, or since you are justified, since you are justified because you have put your faith in Christ Jesus, then uh, though we are still flawed, we strive to live for Christ. We strive to live worthy of our calling. And even when we do fail, First uh, John says that, we have forgiveness of Christ because of the, the, the fit, because of the work of, because of the propitiation, because, because of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus on our behalf. So the finished work of Christ liberates us from, from uh, sin at the moment we believe in him. But even once we have believed in him and if we failed him, we still go to that finished work of Christ to ask for forgiveness to ask for forgiveness. Uh, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 
Amen. Um, the justified person is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin. Let's look at Romans 4, 8. Speaking of David, uh, uh, David uh, is uh, the one that, that says this. Romans chapter 4, verse 8. Verse eight. Let's start here with verse 6, Romans 4, 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness or justification apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. That's the justified person, the person whose, whose sin the Lord does not take into account. The justified person is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin, does not count sin. In terms of justification, God charges the justified man with nothing at all. Uh, Romans chapter 8, 3. Uh, the justified man is free from sin. Uh, he is no longer uh, liable before God. He has been forgiven, declared righteous before God. Romans chapter 8, um, Verse 33, Romans 8.33, 8.33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. You know, I think that when we stand before the, the judgment seat of Christ, the issue is not going to be sin. I think sin has already been dealt with at the cross. The issue is going to be, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the salvation that I gave you? Um, did you work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Not work for your salvation, but work it out. Did, did you uh, work to, to, to um, make that, that uh, new man that you are in Christ evident in your daily life? Uh, that's going to be the issue. What did you do with what I gave you, with the talents that I gave you? Um, and the issue is not going to be condemnation. I think the issue is going to be rewards. It's going to be what did you do so that I could reward you, um, so that um, you can bring praise to, to, so that we can bring praise to Him throughout eternity. But our sins have been dealt with, past, present, and future, at the cross. Uh, so we can live free to do what? To sin? No, free from the guilt of sin, so that we can glorify God, so that we can glorify Him. Amen. Of course, this doctrine of justification by faith apart from works, uh, uh, Paul understood that it could be abused. And that's why he says, What then shall we say? Shall we sin so that grace may abound? And he says, "Never May it never be. Uh, a proper understanding of what Christ has done for us should motivate us to live for Him, to live for Him, to, to want to honor Him in our daily life. Justification, the verb denotes God's powerful, cosmic and uni universal action in affecting a change in the situation between sinful humanity and God, by, by which God is able to acquit and vindicate believers, setting them in a right and faithful relation to himself. Amen. Mm. Interesting. So, uh, another definition by Dr. Mu, to be justified means to be acquitted by God from all charges that could be brought against a person because of his or her sins. The, the judicial verdict for which one had to wait until the last judgment according to Jewish theology, is according to Paul, render the moment a person believes. Interesting. So the Jew would, 
believed in justification, but he believed that that would happen at the last judgment. But according to what we understand from Paul, a person is made just or declared righteous the moment the person believes. In view of the universal, universal sin, justification comes only in this way, by, by grace, through faith. Since all have sinned, all must, be, must find justification in the fashion now described. In particular, sinful men must be justified freely by his grace. Justification is, from first to last, a matter of God's own doing, to which human beings must respond, but to which they can add nothing. That's why it's by faith in Christ Jesus, so that it could be certain, so that our justification can be certain, and so that God can be glorified. And that's, that's what Romans chapter 4 is going to deal with. Abraham was justified by faith and not by works so that the promise can be certain and so that, not, so that God can be glorified. If it was by works, then man could be glorified. But since our justification comes by, by putting our faith in the finished work of Christ, then our justification is certain and it's God who is glorified. It's God who is glorified, not us. Very good. So that's a little bit on justification. It's a forensic term. It's a legal term. It's something that happens the minute we put our faith in Christ Jesus. So if we go back again to Romans uh, chapter 3, um, verses... Romans chapter 3, verse 24, and then we're going to read all the way to 26. Being justified, declared righteous before God... At the moment that we put our faith in him as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the, de for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The word that now will occupy us is propitiation. This word can be translated also as the mercy seat. Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. Um, it's the place where God and man can meet. Uh, that's, that's what propitiation deals with. It's the place where God and man can meet. And uh, it, it, has, it takes us back to the, to the Old Testament, to the sanctuary that God set up, uh, where in the Holy of Holiest, there was an ark. And in that ark between the two angels, uh, that's where God met with men. That's where... Uh, the, the, once a year, the high priest would come and he would sprinkle blood there on, the, uh, on that mercy seat, on that cover of that ark, and, and propitiate, make atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. So it, the sanctuary was set up so that God and man can meet. And, and the, the, the most holy place in that sanctuary was the mercy seat the place where sin was atoned for, where, where, propi, pro, where propitiation took place. Um, Dr. Moose says about propia, uh, propitiation, I'm sorry, propitiation. It says, there can be no gospel unless there is such a thing as a righteousness of God for the ungodly. But just as little... Can there be a gospel unless the integrity of God's character be maintained? Okay? So if, if, there, if only the godly can be justified, there will be no gospel. But since God justifies the ungodly, then there is a gospel. But there, can all, there cannot be a gospel if God's character is not maintained. Okay? So how can God... Uh, justify the ungodly and maintain his character, 
The answer is the finished work of Christ uh, on Calvary, propitiation. The problem of the of sinful world, the problem of the sinful world, the problem of a relig- of all religion, the problem of God in dealing with a sinful race is how to unite these two things. The Christian's answer to the problem is given by Paul in these words. Jesus Christ, to whom God set forth a propitiation. So how can God justify the ungodly and still retain his, his integrity, his, character, his righteous character? The answer is Jesus Christ, whom God set forth a propitiation. Propitiation, turning away of anger by the offering of a gift. That's another um, meaning for the word propitiation. Turning away of God's righteous anger by the offering of a gift. When the New Testament says propitiation then, it means that Jesus' death on the cross for the sins of mankind put away God's wrath against his people once and for all. Amen. First John. First uh, John chapter 2. It says, <clears throat> My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, but what did he first say? <laughs> I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. That's the focus, uh, that we not sin. But if any sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation or the mercy seat for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Amen. He is our propitiation. It is, it is because of him that we can approach God. We don't, go, we don't have the sanctuary any longer. We don't need the sanctuary any longer because that was set up for a temporary time. Uh, we now can approach God directly through the finished work of Christ Jesus. Amen. Propitiation. Christ, Paul implies, now has the place that the mercy seat had in the Old Covenant, the center and focal point of God's provision of atonement for His people. Amen. And now we have a few scriptures that will deal with uh, propitiation in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. But let's go back to um, Romans chapter 3. Propitiation. Okay, verse 26. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be the just and the justifier of the ones who have faith in Jesus. Again, um, let me. This is again from Dr. Constable. I think I've already said it, but I want to read his notes to make sure it's clear. Based on the verse 26 uh, that we already read. It says, another reason that God provided an atoning sacrifice was to justify, was to justify or declare righteous God's own character. Or to vindicate him. So the, the, the atone, the atone, The atonement not only justified the unbeliever, but it also justified God's character 
I think that's, uh, I've, I'm, I've emphasized that a lot. Um, if God forgave sin without there being a proper payment, then God would be unrighteous. You could question his character. But since he, because of the finished work of Christ, then God can forgive sins and he's still just. He is still just. So he says another reason that God provided an atoning sacrifice was to justify God's own character or to vindicate him. This was necessary because God had not finally, finally dealt with sin committed before Jesus died. So God forgave sin in the past, but that sacrifice was not sufficient. God had shown forbearance, not out of weakness or sentimentality as might be suspected, but because he planned to provide a final sacrifice in the future, namely at the cross. So God didn't forgive sins, or God doesn't forgive sins just because he wants to be nice or because he, he, he's a loving God. Uh, no, he, he's, he, he forgave sins because Christ Jesus paid for uh, the condemnation of sin. It wants, in what sense can the death of Christ be said to demonstrate the righteousness of God? It demonstrates it by showing the impossibility, impossibility of simply passing over sin. God did not forgive the sins of Old Testament saints finally until Jesus died on the cross. The blood of the animal sacrifice of Judaism only covered or removed them temporarily. God did not exact a full penalty for sin until Jesus died. It is as though the Old Testament believer who offered the sacrifice for the removal of sin that the Mosaic law required paid for those sins with a credit card. God accepted those sacrifices as a temporary payment. However, the bill came due later, and Jesus Christ paid that off entirely. Paul has thus pressed into service the language of the law, justification. Okay, so he uses all these words to, to, to convey one idea, the, what Christ has done to secure our salvation. Paul has thus passed into service the language Paul has thus pressed into service the language of the law court, justification, the slave market, redemption, and the altar, expi expiation, atoning sacrifice. In the attempt to do justice to the fullness of God's gracious act in Christ, pardon, liberation, atonement, all are made available to, to man and woman by his free initiative and may be appreciated by, or may, it may be appropriated by faith. Praise God. In, in, interesting. Justification has, it has, it deals with the law court. Uh, redemption deals with the slave market. Atoning or expiation deals with the altar. Uh, and all these words combined uh, show the, what God has done to make our salvation possible. Amen. God's love for us is great. And uh, he has, and, I, and I think that if we study these words like we have redemption, propitiation, uh, justification, we could see that it's the work of God on our behalf that makes us free. That makes us that 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 enables us to come before His throne room uh, and receive His mercy. Uh, that we can come before His throne room uh, freely because we come not in our own righteousness; we come in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Um, praise God for that wonderful work of Christ. So now we'll go ahead and look at these scriptures that deal with. Pro uh, propitiation, uh, the atoning work of Christ, how God has covered our sins and how he has satisfied his wrath. Exodus, let's look at Exodus 25. B. 
the Ark of the Covenant. It was there that sin was atoned for. It was there that God was propitiated or God was satisfied. His wrath, his justice was satisfied. They, sh they shall construct an, an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubit wide and one and a half cubit high. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings for it and fasten them on its four feet. And two rings shall be on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make a pole of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings in, on the side of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the, in the ring of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. You shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubit wide. You shall make two cherubims of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherubim to one end and one cherubim at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. Okay, so that's the, 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 the uh, well, let's continue reading to verse 22. But this is where we get the idea of the mercy seat. It's, it's, it's there at... Uh, it's that ark that God, God commanded Moses to, meet, to, to, to make. And it's there where the blood was, was uh, sprinkled and where God and man met and where sins were atoned for. Verse 19, make one cherubim, cherubim at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherub of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall... Have their wings spread up outward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The face of the cherubim are to be burned toward are to be turned towards the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you at the mercy seat. I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandments for the sons of Israel. And then Levit Leviticus chapter 16, the day of atonement, the day when the high priest went into the holy of holies and offered these the blood of the uh, sacrifice as an atonement for the sins of the people. The day of atonement. And that's the whole chapter. I don't think we're going to read all of this chapter. Uh, but, you know, the, hope, the, the high priest first had to offer a sacrifice for his sin. And then once he offered a sacrifice for his sin, then he offered a sacrifice for the sins of of the people and that sacrifice that that, that animal that was sacrificed uh, was not um, was burnt outside of the city it was taken outside of the city and it was burnt completely you know not every sacrifice uh, they, they did that not with they didn't do that with every sacrifice some of the sacrifices they, they could eat the meat uh, and, the, and they could give part of the meat also to the high priest. But this sacrifice was burnt completely, and it was burnt outside of the city. And you can see how that just pictures perfectly the, the work that Christ Jesus did. He offered himself uh, when he, as a sacrifice outside of the city, outside of Jerusalem. And, you know, the writer of the Hebrew, Hebrews also invites us to, to participate with him, with Christ, for us also to, to be willing to, to uh, offer ourselves to, to God and, and to his service. Not that our, that, our, that our service to God atones for sins, but just like he sacrificed himself, we also are called to do the same 
for Christ. So on that day, the, the, the offering the, the, was made that atoned for the sins of the people. And that made it possible for God to continue to dwell amongst his people. The Jews were not a, necess- a, a very obedient people, were they? They weren't. And I think that the same can be said of, of all of us. But what makes it possible for God to continue to dwell with the people of Israel? Well, that sins were atoned for. Sins were atoned for. And now if we go to Hebrews chapter 9, we see that Christ is the fulfillment of the, what was a type in the Old Testament uh, of the mercy seat. Of the mercy seat. He is the mercy seat. It is in Christ Jesus that God and man can come together. God is holy, man is sinful. How can a holy God meet with a sinful with sinful men? Uh, The only the only way is through Christ Jesus, who atones for the sins of mankind, making it possible for man to come to God and God to, to meet with men. Hebrews. Uh, chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 7. He, in the, first, in the uh, previous verses, he talked about what took place in the outer, in the, uh, in the holy place. Now he's going to talk about what took place in the holy of holiest. That's, that's what verse 7 deals with. But into the second, to the second part of the tabernacle, only the high priest entered once a year, not without taking blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place had not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol of the present time. Accordingly, both, accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they related only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Amen. Um, So the work of Christ is definitely definitely superior to the work of the the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. The, The sacrificial system in the Old Testament only made people ceremonially cleaned, but it could never, it never dealt fully with sin. But when Christ came and offered himself, he obtained eternal redemption. He paid for sins completely, once and for all. So there's no need for for more sacrifice or for Christ to continue to sacrifice himself. It was one sacrifice, and that one sacrifice took care of the sins of all humanity. All humanity. Um, And, of course, the ones who benefit from that redemption are those who have put their faith in Christ Jesus. Well, verse 13 says, For if the blood of, the, of goats and bulls and the ashes of, the, of a heifer sprinkling, sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh and make them ceremonially clean, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has 
taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Amen. So the work of Christ on the cross has made it possible for God to forgive our sins and for us to be able to approach God. Um, and, and that's wonderful. You know, the idea of man being able to approach God, how can that possibly be? Since man is sinful, well, it's only through the finished work of Christ Jesus on Calvary. That's why there's only salvation, there's only one way of salvation, and that is through Christ Jesus. And it's not because we, you know, we think we're better or, or because, uh, no, it's because there is, no, so there is no salvation any other way. Uh, how, can you dis, how can we solve that dilemma of, of you know, God who is holy and, and being able to dwell with men who are sinful? How, how, can you dis, how can you resolve that dilemma if there's not a sacrifice? And I don't know of any other religion where there is a sacrifice that atones for the sins of the world. Uh, I don't think that you, there, that you have that uh, any, in any other uh, belief system. Um, and, and, but that's, that's what makes Christianity uh, different. Uh, the grace of God. The sacrifice of Christ Jesus on our behalf. And if we believe this, then I think that that ought to motivate us to want to share our faith with uh, those that, God puts in our path. Um, amen. Luke, let's look at Luke um, 23, 44. It was now about the sixth hour. And darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. This is, this is what's happening at, when, that, when Christ is dying on Calvary. The veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Heaven said this, he breathed his last. Uh, with the rending of the veil in the temple, then the access to God is now open. It's now open to anyone who comes to, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Anyone can come boldly to the throne of grace who comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. No, there's no need to come to him through the, that sacrificial system that was set up in the Old Testament because now Christ is the fulfillment of all those, the, those sacrifices. Um, he, he, that those sacrifices pointed to Christ Jesus. So, so we don't need those sacrifices anymore. We can come through Christ Jesus our Lord. John 14, 6. Amen. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Amen. Uh, no one comes to the Father but through me. Acts, let's look at Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other way to God but through Christ Jesus. Amen. He is the way. He is the propitiation for our sins. Um, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in light as he himself is light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. And then Hebrews chapter 10. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. And the blood of Jesus, it's a reference to his death. It's the death of Christ Jesus 
that cleanses from all sin. It's his finished work on Calvary that cleanses us from all sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 25. Let's read this and then we'll conclude. The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. Amen? Amen. The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. If the issue is how can you approach God, how can a sinful man approach God, the answer is the finished work of Christ Jesus. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifice which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In, in whole burnt offering and sacrifice for sins you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After, sa after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. One more time, verse 10. By, his, by this will we have been sanctified or justified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So this is why he took on a body, so that he could die on our behalf. Verse 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the, the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. It is finished. It is done. Waiting for that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool, footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. We are complete in Christ Jesus. Amen? Uh, it, it, sin has been dealt with. We are, we are righteous in Christ Jesus through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. Verse 15, And the Holy Spirit also testified to us, for afterwards saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after these, those days, says the Lord. I will put my law upon their heart and on their mind. I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of, of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, amen? So what's to, what's to take place? What's the result of that? Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So because of what Christ has done, that ought to stimulate us to be faithful, to persevere, to continue the good fight, to not give in, to not give in. Uh, so yes, theology or un our understanding of what God has done should have some very practical implications. 
And that should be, one of them should be that we should, we come before him boldly and we persevere. We continue in the faith. And then at the end of uh, this chapter, there's a very stern warning for those who do not persevere. You know, there's, there's a very stern warning for those who do not persevere. Uh, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the, the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he ha was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will, repair, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endure a great conflict of suffering. Partly by being made a public spectacle through reproach and tribulation. And partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. I wonder if that could be said of us. Would we be willing to go that far for our faith in Christ Jesus? Lord, help us. I don't know. Um, but they, they did. And, and, you know, the reason they did is because they understood what God had done for them. They understood that they were sanctified, that, that, that they belonged to him. So he's encouraging them to continue doing what they, they, they once did. Um, so that's the effect that our knowing that we have been sanctified, knowing that we have been justified should have in our lives, uh, that, we're, that we persevere to the end in our service to God. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not draw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what he promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but, by, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith <coughs> to the preser preser preserving, preserving of the soul. Amen. So the just shall live by faith. So we're justified through faith in Christ Jesus, and we live by faith. We live by faith. We, we put our faith in Christ Jesus, and um, we approach him confidently, and we persevere. We persevere serving our Lord. Uh, we're fortunate to live in this country where we, we, we're, we don't suffer persecution for our faith. Uh, but, you know, uh, there are those who, who do suffer persecution for their faith. And uh, they, 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 they have a great blessing. They have a great blessing uh, in store for them. Um, and I, I don't know why God has blessed us the way he has, but... You know, that, ought to, that, that we, we are not to, to be complacent in our faith. We are not to be complacent in our faith. We are to, to seek ways that we could uh, uh, serve God day, uh, day by day because of what he has done for us, for what he has done for us. So I, I encourage you I, to, to persevere in your faith and to be willing to give of yourself for the work of Christ. Amen? We need to give of ourselves for the work of Christ. If not, then, then we just load our head with knowledge. And that's not what it's about. It's about putting uh, things into practice, putting our, uh, our faith into practice. Our faith should make us live by faith, persevere until the end. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for giving us this time of reading and studying your word. Thank you, God, for those 
uh, here who give of themselves to make this ministry possible. Uh, our brothers who come and play music and our brother who leads us in music and, and uh, brothers who come and turn on the sound system. Uh, all, all, these, all this implies some kind of sacrifice, some kind of uh, giving of ourselves and giving of our time and our talent. Lord, uh, thank you uh, for, for, for our brethren who, who do this. And, and Lord, I pray that we would take time to, to meditate and ask ourselves, what can we do for you? What can we do as a, as, a, as a gratification or as a, in, in gratitude for what you have already done for us, for, for, whom, for who we are in Christ Jesus? Lord, may you bring some, a, a loved one, uh, someone that we can talk to and share our faith with, someone that we can visit and share our faith with, Lord. May your spirit prompt us to do these things, Lord, and uh, may we be obedient to your leading. Lord, thank you for the work of Christ on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful plan of salvation. Yes, God, it is through your son, Jesus, that we have access to you and that you can come to us and that you can continue to be just even when, when you forgive our sins. So thank you, God, for, for this wonderful plan. And Lord, may we, may May we be willing to share this with others, and may it impact the way we live. Thank you, Father. We ask now that you would take us home safely. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.